Good morning. Oh, you're a good looking bunch this morning. I love the miracle that happens around 1110. The church fills in and we worship God together. I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to each of you. Special welcome to some of our members who have been longtime members back worshiping with us. I'd also invite you, if you're part of the 1105 group, you have missed half of the blessings on Sabbath morning. We gather here a little before, a little after 9.30ish, and we have some Bible studies that go on. They go on in the back of the sanctuary. There's a small group that meets in the pastor study just through this door to my left, your right. And we have kids divisions all the way through. You'll meet some nice people and form some real good relationships as you open the word together. Uh, we invite those who are joining with us by internet. We're glad that you're able to worship with us as well. We live in a very interesting time in this world's history. If I were to ask you to think of some ordinary things that happened this week, what would come to your mind? He went to work. That's kind of ordinary and expected, isn't it? What else? The war in the Middle East. The war in the Middle East? How is that conflict going to be resolved? What else? Gun violence here. The gun violence here and the shooting at the college. What else? Ordinary. The sun came up and the sun went down. That's pretty ordinary, isn't it? I'm sorry, again? Taking care of your families as part of the normal, typical responsibilities. We can dwell on the ordinary things on a regular basis. When we go to the other side of the spectrum, though, the sacred, what do you think about during the week? The hope of Jesus' second coming and returning soon that we might be with him? How amazing, God is. How amazing he is. So you can sense God's timing and working and promptings of the Holy Spirit in the way that he interacts in ways that we don't anticipate. Is everything ordinary, sacred? Is everything sacred, ordinary? Is there a difference between the two? Should there be a difference between the two? Should everything be blended together so that there's no distinction? As Christians, is every moment of our life sacred? Are some moments in our life more ordinary? How do those two things relate and interact? I have two books in my hand this morning. I have a book that's entitled, I just pulled it off the shelf, Gently Lead, How to Teach Your Children About God While Finding Out for Yourself. Sounds like a good book. And I have the scripture itself. Now, which one would you say is sacred? Which one professes to be sacred? The scriptures, the word of God. This is probably a very good book, but probably is more ordinary. So do we distinguish between the ordinary and the sacred today? Sure we do. In John chapter 2, I believe we find there uh, a couple of stories that illustrate a little bit of the difference between that which is sacred and that which is ordinary, and how the ordinary at times becomes sacred, and how that which is sacred at times becomes ordinary. 
Did you catch the uh, nuance there? So we're going to uh, do a little bit of distinction between the two, and we're going to look at how one becomes the other, and at times the other becomes the other as well. All right, in John chapter 2, we find there the story. We've already looked at John chapter 1, and we've, we found in John chapter 1, John chapter 1 in, introduced Jesus as the Word of God, and the, had the authority and the fullness of God as he came uh, to this earth. In John chapter 2, there's an interesting story of the marriage. I love stories about marriage because the marriage ceremony in days of old was much different than the ceremony today. The ceremony today often takes on, I'm going to get married on um, May 29th, and you send out wedding invitations far and wide, and you have an afternoon or an evening event or a morning event, a part of a day event, maybe the full day, if it's a, a longer type ceremony. Such was not the case in the time of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, if you were going to have a wedding, word would go out, um, not a tweet on your cell phone, not an email, uh, not an invitation through the mail, but it was customary, customary that it would go out through the old-fashioned word of mouth through the town. My daughter's getting married on the third day of next week. And the wedding party would start. At, uh, the bride of the father would bring, um, would escort the bride to the groom's door and would walk through town inviting guests along the way. And it would be a week's festivity, a full week of, uh, of getting acquainted with your neighbors. And then came the ceremony, and the wedding took place. And after the ceremony, there is the natural reception, and everybody knows that at the reception, everything should go just as the bride and groom wanted it to be. All the plans were laid, everything was put in order, and everything should just go like clockwork. Well, we find here a story of that which is ordinary and a story of that which is sacred at the same time. It's an ordinary wedding, and somehow in verse 5, this wedding story, his mother, being Jesus' mother, said unto the servants, What's, um, let, me, uh, let me go back to verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have none. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were six pots of stone. Thereafter the matter of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three Firkins a piece, and Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. It's an interesting story. The you know the story as well as I do that uh, the feast had been prepared, but they ran out of wine, and Jesus' mother, who was probably in charge of hosting this and making sure all of the details were put together, knew of Christ's ability to create. And the scriptures records that this was some of the first signs of the miracles that he would work. Wouldn't it have been great to have been there, friends? To see those pots of water, which were so often filled with the water to purify the, feet, the Jewish purification. And the servants were instructed to put water in. And Jesus just says a few words. And instantly, instantly, at the words of Jesus, that water is turned to wine. What an amazing thing, isn't it? That Jesus, just by word, just by thought, can transform that which is ordinary into that which is blessed by God, and that which becomes sacred to some extent. Because that wine was symbolic 
not of the Jewish uh, water washing and purification. But the wine took on the symbolism of Christ's own blood that's poured out, that we use at communion, foreshadowing another, uh, another event of his crucifixion, foreshadowing the emblems that we would partake of today. Christ transforms that which is ordinary, and they became sacred. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, which was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse thou hast kept the good wine until now. This being the miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. And after this he went to Capernaum, and his mother and his brethren, and his disciples, they continued there not many days. How is it, friends, though, that Jesus turned the ordinary by his presence in blessing and made that which was ordinary into that which is sacred. So let me ask you a question. Are there sacred things that are happening in your life that God has given you that you so often take as ordinary? Are you able to distinguish among the ordinary things that God has proclaimed are sacred? So let me share just a few that we so often take for granted. And as I do so, ask yourself the question, is it true that I often take these for granted and fail to realize the sacredness of each of these? I'd suggest to you today that your life, your ordinary life, do you ever feel very ordinary? That you just blend in among the masses, that you are just one of the six, how many billion people in the world now? Seven? Eight? Billions of people in the world. That if you were missing, nobody would miss you. That in a congregation of 150, 200 members, you're just one among many. That if I really try hard, I might come up to the statute of being ordinary, and I'd be satisfied at that. Have you ever felt that way? Or perhaps you don't even feel ordinary. You're somewhere underneath, down here, down here, down here, and if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you might get up over the level of your socks if you're wearing them. Sometimes we just feel so plain and troubled in life, don't we? I got good news for you today, Bunky, if you're feeling that way. At times we all feel very ordinary. But let's look today to see what God can do and how he can bless ordinary people to see not what others tell us, but what the Word of God proclaims today. Because God loves to transform that which is ordinary into that which is sacred. Do you believe that, friends? You believe it. Now let's see it from Scripture. You're good Scripture students today. Your life is sacred. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The first thing to note is your ordinary life is not ordinary at all. Because you did not evolve from some cosmic event billions of years ago. You were designed by the Creator. And when he created you, he imprinted on your soul his image. Now, you may have defiled it. It may be rusty. It may be buried. It may be scarred. It may be marred. 
But Christ has created you just the way you are. And if he created you just the way you are, when you seek him and embrace that which he has, he has created and dedicated, dedicate that to him, he will bless you. He will move you from a consciousness of just barely getting along to being somebody who's been created in his image. And that makes all the difference in the way that you face life. Do you believe that, friends? Oh, some of you are partially here with me, and the rest of you will catch up on Tuesday. It makes all the difference in the world when you realize that God has created you in his image. And when you open up your life to him, he takes that which we view as very ordinary, sends his spirit into a life to do and to accomplish extraordinary things, not through our own power, but through the power of God to bless others, to elevate our lives to the place that he wants us to be walking in harmony in the design that he has for us. Life is so sacred. Life is so sacred. Lamentation says it is of the Lord's, Lamentations 3.22 and 23 says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Something we so often take for granted, the newness of another day of life in which to embrace the fullness of the day that God has given to us. Life is so sacred, it's blessed of God. That which is ordinary. Your time is sacred. Have you ever thought about the ordinary time in our life? Time cl clicks by so quickly. You work 60 hours a week and you go, where did that go? I've got so much to do in the seventh day of the week. Maybe I'll go to church today. Maybe I'll just call the girls and do something else or call the guys and watch football or do something else, uh, wash the car. Is there anything different between ordinary time and sacred time? What do you think? What makes it different? Come on, friends. You appreciate it. I, you know, I appreciate the days, seven days a week, and if I have Thursday off and don't have anything to do, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Is Thursday any more ordinary or sacred than Monday or Friday? Is there any particular sacredness on any day of the week? Let's look together for just a minute. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. Just looking rather quickly. Verse two, uh, Genesis 2, verse 2, and verse 3. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And notice the next verse in verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he rested from all his work, which God created and made. Was God tired? No. <laughs> Let's see. Um... <laughs> I created the world. Oh, I think I'll take a day off every seven days. He created the world and he gave us, he blessed the Sabbath day and he sanctified it. And the root word means set it aside as holy for our benefit. Is there any day, one day out of seven, that's more blessed than others? Yes. yes. Which day of the week is it? Sabbath, that's correct, Saturday, from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. A sacred time to come together. Ordinary time, 24 hours a day. What makes it different? God's blessing upon it, making it sacred. I go shopping for cars. Oops. <laughs> My wife goes shopping for shoes. We do a lot of secular things all during the week. But the sacred time of the Sabbath hours, we commit to drawing into a closer relationship with Christ, fellowshipping with the body of believers, sharing our faith with others. Your life is ordinary. It's sacred when God transforms it. Your time is ordinary. It's sacred when God transforms it. And he sets one day aside as sacred, and that's a transformation. 
It's an interesting thing in John chapter 2, because it's the blessing of God that transforms that which is ordinary into that which is sacred. I'll just touch on a couple of others. Uh, your resources are sacred. Uh, your resources are sacred. Um, the means that God has given you are sacred. To the rich young ruler, it's recorded that Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing he said you lack, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have your treasure where? In heaven and follow me. We so often look at the ordinary things, what we own, the car we drive, the house we live in, the bills we pay, as all of our own. But Christ wants more. He wants our heart so that everything that he has allowed us to gain is dedicated to him. It's not the size of, of your house, it's the size of your commitment. Our resources are sacred. We're going to look, um, our talents are sacred as well when they're used for God. Our friendships are sacred when they're dedicated to God. Don't you know the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. If anyone destroys the temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Did you, ca did you catch that? Nuance that at all? Your entire life by God is his temple to be consecrated to him. He wants to transform every single part of our life. We look at ourselves as so ordinary and in and of ourselves so hopeless, in and of ourselves so powerless, in and of ourselves so meaningless. But the good news, friends, the good news is John chapter 12, uh, John chapter 2. God specializes in the ordinary, in the ability to transform that which is ordinary into that which is sacred. Do you like that news? Do you want it to happen in your life today? I want it to happen in my life today. It happens, friends, as we open our hearts and our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise is given that as we do so, He will take our lives and take that which is ordinary and transform them and make, make them sacred for His use. But I find in John chapter 2, just an interesting puzzlement. The first half of the chapter is great. Here, are, here is the first of the signs of miracles that Jesus is going to do that will show the world that he is God and he has the ability to create and he has the ability to transform things. He has the ability to move in the world and that he's the son of God. And then there comes this interesting paradox and it doesn't fit. It really doesn't fit. We have a miracle here, and then we have a cleansing of a temple over here. And how does one relate to the other? I studied this for a few weeks, and I said, I don't get it, God. He, he just told me, keep reading. I kept reading it, and I kept reading it. So follow along, John chapter 2. Um, as he entered the temple... Verse 15 says, And when he had made a scourge, scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the uh, tables. And he said to them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it is written, The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? So you have the blessing and the sign, and you have the cleansing of the temple. Some say Jesus was angry. Some say it was a righteous judgment in cleansing the temple. They had turned that which was sacred into that which was ordinary. Just backwards, 
of the first story, isn't it? Jesus turned in the first, uh, the first story, that which is ordinary by his power and made that which is, uh, made it sacred. And now in the second half of this, he's saying that his house of worship is so sacred. Now these people came from many miles around to worship in the temple and they had to bring uh, their offering their sin offering with them. Some of them traveled many days and weeks to get to the temple. And so it was a bit of inconvenience to carry that offering, whether it was a lamb, pigeons, whatever blood offering was required. So to make it a little more convenient for those, so they wouldn't have to go out of the way too much, somebody set up court and set up a merchandising booth, what we would call it today, in the back ever so discreetly, and uh, the proceeds from that would go to the temple. And after all, as long as it ends up in the temple, everything's good. And so they would buy their, uh, they would buy their offerings. They would exchange uh, their coin of the day into an offering. And then they would offer the offering in obedience to the requirements of God. But in so doing, they lacked the ability to understand the fullness of the holiness of the place of God. They transformed that which is sacred into that which is ordinary. In the first part, we go from ordinary to sacred. In the second part, we go from sacred to ordinary. The scripture says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 3, And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Every single sacred place of God should be known as a house of prayer. Do you believe that, friends? A place where the soul can find solace before the service, after the service, and during the service. But we so often get busy. We, we bring our cares, we bring that which is common and ordinary into the house of God, and we say, oh God, I'm so wrought up. I'm not sure I can commune with you. How does this happen? How does it squeeze in? How do we take that which is sacred? And suddenly over time, it becomes ordinary. And if we're not careful, friends, we will continue to repeat that. There's a story of Esau and Jacob. You remember the story? They were what? They were what? They were twins. They were twin brothers. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. I'm going to share that uh, scripture with you in just a minute. But to set the background just for a minute, Esau and Jacob were twins. Now the firstborn at that time had a birthright. And the firstborn, by just a minute or two, had a, by birthright a double portion of the inheritance. If there were six males in the family, it would be uh, the father's estate would be divided up seven ways with the oldest by birthright receiving two portions. Very important. Uh, not something to be taken lightly. When the father died by birthright, the son took the father's place in leading the family in uh, patriarchal ma uh, matters a very patriarchal society at that time. You know the story well. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, it says, uh, an interesting commentary on Esau. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. There's a lot of verses I'd like to be remembered in, this would not be one of them. How about you, friends? The, the footnote on Esau is who for one morsel of bread sold his birthright. You remember the story. He had been the hunter in the family. 
and had went out hunting on a journey and came back without any food. Famished. Famished. He just wanted some porridge. He wasn't worried up about the birthright that would happen somewhere in the future. And as he came forward, Jacob said, you'd like some food? How about, how about trading me, Esau said, a bowl, a bowl of porridge for my birthright. In an instant, in just an instant, he traded away his birthright. Bad trade. Worse trade in the world. In the first part of John chapter 2, there's good trades going on. That which is ordinary becoming sacred. In the second half of John chapter 2, it stands out as a glaring warning. We find friends sometimes in other people's lives who will remain unnamed. They're trading their birthright, their spiritual birthright, for a little porridge today. And if we're honest today, we at times find that we do it in our lives. We're too busy, too busy to open the Scriptures daily. We're too busy to worry about what God wants us to do. After all, we've got so much to do, whatever's left over, we'll give to God. We'll, we'll give Him what's left after we have life figured out. And we so often get so caught up in the moment, and we make choices that scar us for days, weeks, and even lifetimes for just a little porridge of this world. Have you been there? Have you done that? I've got good news for you today, friends. You don't need to continue doing that. There is a place, an opportunity of restoration for the inherited birthright that Esau had a right to might be yours today through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Taking up all of life's difficulties, taking up all of those things that so easily crowd out the sacred, looking at your time and realizing it's not yours, but it's God's, but you've been so busy, looking at your worship and saying you filled it so infrequently, looking at your means and realizing you've used them for your own gain, looking at your relationships and saying, I've just been part of the ordinary talk. I want to change that today. I want to be called by God's purpose. As New Testament Christians, we have an inherited birthright status through Jesus Christ as the firstborn Son of God. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow He also predestined to, uh, to be conformed to the image of the Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, He did predestinate them he also called, whom he called. Them he justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. It's an amazing thing to me, friends, that God, in all of his patience, God, in all of his love, God, in all of his wonderful mercy, still calls us back from the ordinary to the sacred that we might not be just ordinary today, regardless of how we've lived in the past, regardless of what you've done last week, regardless of this morning, when you know you weren't right with some people, you know you weren't right with God, regardless of all of that, He simply invites us again through the birthright of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that our birthright 
might be restored by his goodness and grace. He wants to bring glory and honor into your life. He wants to take that which is ordinary and make it sacred. Would you, to, would you today open your hearts and life to the calling of the Holy Spirit that as you go through this next week and through this day, that you'll realize your time is sacred time, that your life is a sacred life to be used in glory, glorifying God, that your means are His means, that your influence should be His influence to a perishing world. Then that which is ordinary will become sacred which, when it is imbued and empowered by the Spirit of God. Let us pray together. Father, you have blessed us by giving us your sacred word. You've blessed us, Father, by pouring out your Holy Spirit. You've blessed us, Father, by giving us life, abilities. You've blessed us, Father, with time, sacred time, with means, with character. You've blessed us, Father, with talent. You've blessed us, Father, with friends. Oh, Father, many times we've turned away through indifference, through lack of realizing the sacredness in all of the totality of that. But Father, we lay our lives at the foot of the cross again today. Take us as ordinary. Transform our lives just as you did that water 2,000 years ago, from ordinary to sacred, that we might live to glorify you. We ask through Christ's precious name. Amen.